Part 1, Chapter 11, Derelict Relation Distant, desynced movies played forward in reverse. A visual, my seventh birthday. I couldn't see her face, but I knew the shadow that glided in the background of me blowing out the candles was her. Most of the details were lost to time. Still, the sentiment held me tight. It grew further from my sight, and with it came the cold clasp of reality sinking in. I still smiled, letting slip a happy, deep sigh. I needed this memory, even if it was short and incomplete. I needed a blip of something positive to fight the nightmare. Stirring darkness. The rustle of fabric beneath me was the first piece of evidence I collected that last night was a dream. Those yellow eyes and decrepit face haunted me. It seemed so real. Three light taps, a stirring in my bed. Two knocks, this time with reserved intent. My crusted eyelids were glued together like tree sap. The world was fuzzy and swaying as I rolled onto my side, facing the noise. The door handle jiggled, and the hinges cried softly as the door parted open. My vision slowly adjusted to the daylight reflecting off my walls. Kim? My sight became clear, and I saw my dad standing with slumped shoulders in my doorway. In an instant, I was fully awake and sitting up in my bed on high alert. Not everything from last night was a dream. He witnessed my harsh rise and froze. His gaze fell to the floor and his body seemed drained. I'm sorry to wake you. His words barely made it out of his mouth. I thought you should know it's almost eleven. You should get out of bed soon. My initial fiery stare had simmered once I saw how he held himself. He didn't look angry or rigid. Instead, he just seemed... Lost? I spoke in a normal but still groggy voice. Okay. He released the door handle and stood a little straighter now. You're actually talking to me. He seemed surprised, relieved, and puzzled all at once. Then he saw the gauze sloppily taped on, and his face sank some more, creating new wrinkles and divots. He started again. I, uh, remember what happened yesterday. He looked away toward the window. Do you? I whispered. He spoke very slowly, tiptoeing his words. It doesn't count for much, but I wanted you to know I am sorry. My irritation spiked with a huff. That doesn't mean anything to me. I said in a tone similar to his own hurtful words. I pushed the blankets that I somehow ended up under off me and hung my feet over the edge of my bed, still in yesterday's clothes. Sitting on the edge and trying to avoid his eyes, I stared down at my lap. The dried mud was embedded into my knees and random drops of brownish red were sprinkled all over my pants. Truth be told, I was trying so hard not to start screaming at him or jump up and punch him in the face. I don't know why, but it just didn't feel right anymore. The contemporary rage spiraled around, but the energy and willpower had dissipated. He sighed loudly, and I softly glared as he took two steps in. I was positioned right in the middle, and he came up on my left side near the foot of the bed. Can I sit? He asked politely, still sounding gruff. All my movements were slow and calculated. Even sliding over to make room for him was done so in a way to explicitly display my mood. Why not? Everything in this house belongs to you, anyway. He sighed. No, not everything. He sat down and the bed sank under his weight. Another pause. Neither of us spoke, moved, or even breathed too loud. The interval between us did not last forever, though, and within five minutes, he spoke up. I want to explain to you what happened, even though it won't change what I did. Will you hear me out? He asked permission. I shrugged. I guess. He wasted no time, anxious to speak. I wanted to start off by swearing to you that I only had two cans. That's it. 
and you know me well enough to understand that two beers might as well just be water. I hardly get a buzz from that, but when you got home, I don't know what happened. Suddenly, I just felt this uncontrollable anger toward you. He gestured a swelling motion around his chest. It was like all I wanted to do was... His voice began to stutter, and he had to stop himself. I could sense his emotion. This sturdy man with his feelings under lock and key was actually breaking, right in front of me. I looked at him, and my own anger subsided. He continued, disbelief on the tip of his tongue. I was fighting myself for control, and I said some terrible things. And then you got hurt. The moment I saw you run out that door... It, it was like I lost a hundred pounds, and everything was clear again. My voice still maintained a low, distrusting tone. If everything was clear to you, then why did you leave right after? He huffed. I wanted to go after you, but what would you have done if you saw me chasing you? I would have grabbed a big rock and thrown it at your head. I answered with shame. Good, he replied. I gave him an uncertain look. That's exactly what I would have wanted you to do. Fight back. Because I wasn't in the right state of mind. I could have hurt you even worse. That's why I left. I had to clear my thoughts. Even though we were mere inches apart, it felt like we were separated by a chasm of issues and angst. I moved another inch away so I could turn my body toward him a little more. No longer did I want to speak to the wall. I wanted to address him personally. I want to see his face. His regret. I swear to God, Kim, that whatever I said to you, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean any of it. I bit the inside of my cheek and struggled with his sincerity. Where did you go, Dad? I asked, unable to ignore the feeling of abandonment regardless of his reason. He turned slightly as well. I blanked completely. Once I started driving, I didn't snap out of it until I hit about 80 on the highway. I pulled off at the nearest gas station and just sat in the parking lot for a while. I stared at his face as it sank and sank. He was clearly feeling true emotions, but had no way to manage them. His display of regret didn't absolve what he did. The more I stared at him, the more my brows lowered, until I snapped. Do you have any idea what you put me through? I thought you were going to kill me. I ran for my life into the woods, all alone in the dark. My eyes burned, my voice cracking with a new screaming sob. Kim, I... You don't get to make excuses anymore. After everything, you decided to drive away like a maniac. What if you had gotten into an accident and died? Then what? What would happen to me? I shouted violently, tears flowing like a river. He went still and the room was filled with the sound of my frustrated, restricted crying. I tried to hold my head up, but it fell forward, and my arms went limp by my side. Then, something strange happened. As the tears dripped from my face and onto my legs, I felt both of his arms close around me. He had leaned in, and was holding onto me so gently, trembling. Kim, I... I messed up. And I can't ever take it back. But I swear it will never happen again. He wasn't crying, but his voice was unquestionably weak. My eyes were open wide, and my tear ducts stopped producing the rain. So many emotions exploded in my head. Anger and sadness clashed with empathy and remorse, also throwing in happiness and relief. In the end, my eyes closed, and my hand rose up tenderly holding the forearm which reached across my collarbone and loosely held my right shoulder. He was holding me. A gentle side hug was the first hug I'd gotten from my dad in years. Come to think of it, I don't remember the last time anyone gave me a hug. This was rare for me. For us. I whispered low. You made that promise before last year. I know. 
I could hear his heart steadily beating through his sensitive shell. The eight-year-old in me cherished this moment, a long-desired father-daughter moment I so desperately lacked. But the adult inside understood everything about this situation and was torn to pieces. Conflicted by a compelling moral obligation to tear myself away and continue my verbal assault, displaying raw impudence in the face of a man that diminishes me and long since relinquished his rights as my father in exchange for numbing potions of false vigor. Or remain idle and allow this moment, heightened by his sense of duty and appearance, to go on forever and give the impression of accepted repentance in his mind. I took a breath, then attempted to stand. He released me without any struggle or defiance. On my feet, I let out the air in my lungs, took some back in, and turned to face him. His face was less strict now, although his cheeks were slightly red. In my eyes, he genuinely looked sorry, and that counts for something. That being said, I refused to look past this and just let it go. You know, Dad, I don't forgive you. He scoffed in an amused way. I decided right then that, for now, I would play nice. After all, I've never gotten an apology this sincere from him. Although, I grinned a little, you did apologize, and I know you meant it. I won't forget that. My angst receded. I'm guessing he was still a little stunned, because he just kind of sat there and shifted his eyes looking at me, then his feet, and back to me. I hear you. Now, can you get out so I can get changed? I said with a somewhat false grin. He placed both hands on his thighs and used them as support to force himself up. Loud thumps echoed in the still air as he made his way out the door. He took two steps out and stopped, turning his head toward me. I'll be just downstairs if you need me. Sure. I spoke in a muted tone and closed the door behind him. His steps continued down the stairs, and I took a moment to collect myself, clearing my throat from the brief yelling and crying. On top of my dresser was a box of tissues I hardly ever used, until now. I took a few and used them to blow my nose and get all the sand out of my eyes. At my dresser, I tore off each article of clothing, replaced by a purple shirt, black pants, and a fresh pair of white socks. Lastly, I grabbed a dark gray zip-up sweatshirt from my closet and threw that on as well. Nothing felt better than a complete change of clothes. It was enough to lift my spirits, but not enough to keep my mind from the gutter. It simply couldn't be helped. I imagined the face of that old man and tried to recall his mysterious words. I remember the sensations he forced on me, the disorientation and pain. It felt so real just like the dream of that girl Lucy. Yet, now it all wormed in my brain like a tasteless daydream, a uh, wild imagining. Did that even happen? Regardless, I can't deny those bright, piercing yellow eyes, burning an invasive fingerprint of evil on my soul that birthed a new sickness. I blinked. The clothes I previously wore had been lobbed into a small pile to the left of my dresser to be taken care of later. I moved over to the window and examined the day just beyond the glass. The blue sky and proud sun illuminated every shade of green in the trees and gave me a serene, hospitable feeling. I felt an anxious pinch in my chest as I walked out my door, breathing in the crusted air of the hallway and house. I sauntered over to the railing and peered over, ogling down at the floor below. I partially leaned against the rail, aware of my own weight and its fragility. After all these years, I don't trust it. I could see my dad standing in the kitchen, fully dressed in tan cargo pants and a white long sleeve shirt bearing some construction company's logo on the chest. He appeared distant, looking into the living room with empty eyes and sipping on a glass of water. I called out to him. Are you drinking water? He blinked, sinking back into reality and looked up at me. Yep. Figured it would be a smart choice. He took a gulp and cringed at the taste. God, I hate water. Why? It doesn't really have a taste. Yeah, it does. Tastes like plumbing. If you say so, I half chuckled. 
My ears rang with how quiet the house was. It was never this empty sounding unless he wasn't home. There was always some noise, whether it was the television, radio, or background noise from him working outside. He cleared his throat. So it's Saturday. Got any plans? I shrugged. Not sure. I have a lot on my mind, so it would be in my best interest to distract myself. He took another sip and finished the glass, then set it in the dirty sink. He walked to the center of the room and gave all his attention to me. I'm thinking about running to the store. You can come too, if you wanna. I cocked an eyebrow. The store? Yeah, you know, I got another job tomorrow that is gonna last until Monday morning. I'm going someplace in Chester County, I think, to put up drywall in a big office complex. I was planning on chipping in with some snacks for the rest of the guys, so... I pondered for a minute. I'm kind of glad he won't be here tomorrow, and more so that I can expect him to be gone instead of just waking up and finding him absent. Still, I feared being alone, now and tomorrow, but that's a worry for a later time. All right, I said with a little emotion. He let a tiny smile form at the corner of his mouth. Great, and uh, looks like you're all ready, so let's get going. I didn't say anything, just turned and walked down the stairs. I met him by the front door and slipped my feet into my shoes while he stomped into his work boots. We got outside quickly, and I embraced the refreshing air while he locked the door behind us. Among the random scents of mixed nature was an accustomed one that plucked at my senses. Carried by the wind was the scent of his car and all of its fresheners, so blatant and clearly defined among all other smells that it was distracting. Walking to the car, I felt positive and yet so far away at the same time. I could tell he was happy that I was going with him, but it was clear he was uncomfortable as well. His car was parked dead center of the driveway like usual. A shiny, dark blue sedan carried him from place to place. My dad, if he had the choice, would never own a car like this. He's all about muscle cars, trucks, and classics. I'm always surprised he can even fit all of his tools in the tiny trunk. He told me time and time again that his dream car is a 78 Firebird, specifically a bright, flashy orange, so it would be impossible not to notice him. However, even if he could afford a new car, there are two reasons he won't. One, he has a lot invested in this one. After the accident, he told me that the insurance company covered all the repairs, but he still checks every component often to make sure it's all pristine sometimes spending precious food money on little parts that aren't the most crucial. Second, and most importantly, this car belonged to my mom. I paid close attention to the front passenger side where he said the collision happened. As I passed by the windshield and got a glance at the front seat, a pit formed in my stomach, knowing that this is where she died. Sentimentality is one thing but I don't know how any sane person can go on driving in a car with such a personal history. I opened the back door and climbed in, choosing to sit behind the passenger seat. He climbed in the front, and as soon as he started the engine, I put my seatbelt on. Nothing was said as he backed out of the driveway and pulled onto the road. The engine purred, and we were off. The car ride started off bumpy, but the closer we got to town, the smoother the roads became, but not by much. I didn't ride in the car often. Most days if I ever left the house, it was either by walking or the school bus, so being in here right now felt so weird. Mostly being so low to the ground in a moving vehicle, that made it somewhat nauseating compared to the school bus. I took the time to look at the interior and made note of how clean it was. The house may be a pigsty, but this car was immaculate. No trash, no dirt and nothing cluttering the floor or seats. It was almost like he didn't drive it at all. We reached the wheat field and halted at the stop sign for a moment, still silent. He continued straight, and after another 200 feet, turned right onto the highway, which passed through the center of town. It wasn't any more than five minutes on this road before we took another right into a small parking lot of a grocery store. The parking lot was empty, so finding a spot was mindless. Once parked... The vibrating car was reduced to a simmering hush and then stopped. He turned his head and looked at me. 
All right. I have to get some stuff for them, like I said, but do you want to go in and maybe grab some things for the house? Like what? You replaced the rotted stuff, I asked as I unbuckled my seatbelt. I was thinking, since I always buy the same crap, maybe you can choose, let's say, two boxes of cereal. Whatever you want, as long as it stays under $10. Just none of that organic crap, he instructed. My eyes lit up. Really? I mean, I like that oat and flakes you buy, but I would love to get something really sweet. Ever since I kicked the soda habit, I get sugar cravings, especially in the morning. I grinned widely, a little too happy. Come on, kiddo. Let's get a move on. He pushed open his door and got out, and I did the same. We walked to the entrance a fair distance apart from each other, but still as a pair. The censored door slid open for us, and we were met by the radiant glow of a mostly clean store. He grabbed two hand baskets by the door and handed me one. Go ahead and grab your cereal, and while you're over there, get some more milk too. I just might want to have some. I took the basket by the handles and raised an eyebrow. <laughs> Dream on. This cereal is mine. I joked. He shook his head, amused, and we went our separate ways. Before I got too far, I stopped and watched him, examining the way he moved down the long strip. He stood with his chest raised, broad and defensive like a wall, chin up, stiff, a front. He made a turn at the other end of the store out of view, and I moved to the right, a couple of rows down toward the cereal aisle. It wasn't a big store by any means, but to me, it seemed huge. I must have walked up and down this one aisle, searching for exactly what I wanted almost ten times. I think the main problem was that I was distracted. I saw the different colors of boxes and mascots, but nothing stayed in my head for more than a few seconds because I was stuck on one thought. Just my dad. His current behavior confused me. I haven't seen him scowl since we left the house. He always lived a one-man pity party that was permanently painted on his face. Without it, I didn't recognize him. But today, I saw him smile, and he even chuckled once or twice. That alone is extremely unusual, and now he brings me to the store and lets me choose my own cereal. This change of attitude was clearly a mask, a thin one at that. Then again, maybe it's not. Maybe he really is trying to improve, and these actions are genuine. It's hard to tell, even if my instincts usher me one way. I stopped pacing. Right in front of me was what I was searching for. Vanilla almond and granola cereal, practically glowing on the shelf and begging me to take it. I snatched it up and put it in my basket. All previous thoughts had escaped me, completely overwritten by the sight of such a magnificent item. <laughs> I sure am childish. Three more boxes down was another cereal that I grabbed, but couldn't compare it to the first. This was a colorful, fruity cereal I know my dad would like. Feeling satisfied, I made my way to the milk and went to the registers to meet with him. The store was pretty empty for what I expected, and I stood almost completely alone besides one or two clearly bored cashiers. I waited there for almost 15 minutes, eyeing the lights, ceiling tiles, the scuffed floor, and some magazines close by. Never once did I see him move between aisles or anything. The weight of the milk in my basket became too cumbersome, and I had to set it down on the floor. All in all, we'd been here for nearly thirty minutes now, and all that elation had faded away. Worry was starting to replace it. Worry for him, for the momentum of his attitude, and worry for the unknown. The condensation from the milk dripped through the holes in the basket and created a small damp puddle on the floor. Finally, I saw him turn a corner and spot me. Meeting with his eyes, I lifted my basket again and waited some more until he approached me. You got everything? I asked. He didn't respond, just gave me a grunt which indicated a yes. I glanced at his basket. Inside was a large pack of jerky, some crackers, pudding cups, and chocolate-covered raisins. Not much considering how long he had been missing and what he was shopping for. I saw the raisins and got excited. Oh, uh, could I get a bar of chocolate? I asked happily, now thinking about sweets. He mumbled to himself, but I didn't hear him. What was that? I asked. 
He gave me this eye look and spoke up a little too loud. I said you can never be satisfied, can you? He spoke sharply. I was taken aback, and even the lady at the register was giving us funny looks. Uh, okay. Never mind. I said defensively. He set the basket down and rubbed his face with his hands. No, no, it's, it's fine, he sighed, seeming frustrated but trying to keep a level head. You can get a chocolate bar. He scratched his head and blinked hard, then picked his basket back up and started placing his things on the conveyor belt. I did the same but kept my eye on him. You feel okay? I asked. Uh, it's nothing, just a headache, that's all. One after the other, our items were scanned, and the total kept rising. I didn't realize just how expensive jerky was until now, and the concept of bills and money grew a little more clear to me. After everything was scanned and bagged, my dad stepped up to pay. $33.20. He pulled two $20 bills from his wallet and handed them to the lady. Uh, hold on, he stopped and looked at me. Did you get the chocolate? No, don't worry about it. Kim, I said you could get it. Yeah, but it's no big deal, really, I stated. The lady looked at us, and I looked at her, then back to him. Now painfully aware of his attitude, the bloody bandage on my face, and the connotation that might lead her to believe, he groaned. <sighs> Whatever. He finished paying, and the lady handed him his change. After that, he took all the bags in both hands, and we left the store. It was almost noon now, and the sun proudly displayed that fact. There were almost no clouds in the sky, meaning it was a bit warmer than most days. Not that it was hot by any means, but just comfortable enough in this sweatshirt. As we loaded into the car and set the bags on the seats to my left, I thought about the rest of my day. Honestly, I didn't want to do much. Today or tomorrow, for that matter. It's the weekend, and I want to sleep it away, especially after everything that happened. I don't feel rested at all. So much has happened in the past few weeks that I can barely keep track of it all. Buckled in and semi-comfortable, he turned the key, and the car sprang to life. He rolled the car over to the exit and waited as a couple of cars passed by. After turning left onto the highway, we were on our way home. He was going about five under the speed limit, which was slow enough already. I noticed he seemed on edge again and felt compelled to speak, try to keep some of that good energy brewing between us. So, Dad, I started. This job tomorrow, is it going to pay well? He glanced at me through the mirror, then focused on the road. Eh, not really. I mean, it'll pay, but we won't be leaving town anytime soon. He spoke in monotone, although not seeming disinterested in me. But money's money, right? Yeah, I affirmed. He looked at me again through the mirror, this time lingering longer than someone behind the wheel should. Why do you say that? He asked me, now looking to the road again. Say what? Why do you say yeah like yeah? Uh, I'm not really sure. I just always have, I answered, staring at the passing trees through the window. There was a minute of quiet. Then he started chuckling to himself. I caught this and gave him a look. What's so funny? I just realized. Rachel used to talk to you in a baby voice almost constantly. Ah, oh, it drove me nuts. What does that have to do with anything? Your mom was responsible for teaching you to speak when you were younger, but she always used that stupid baby voice until I got on her ass about it. I told her if you hear the words spoken like that, then that's how you'll learn them. You must have picked up on the way she said yeah to you. I pondered that thought. You know, that kind of makes sense. I said a little surprised. Man, she was the character, that's for sure. He smiled to himself. There was a stillness between us, and I found myself drifting more toward the center of the car, looking at him. Dad, I said softly. Hmm? Can you tell me some more stuff about Mom? 
What stuff? His voice was reserved, too, now. Just what she was like, and what she looked like. What she looked like? You're telling me you don't remember? He almost sounded insulted. No, I really don't. There are no pictures in the house anymore, and she died eight years ago, so I don't remember all that well. Sometimes, rarely, when she's in a dream, I think I see her face, but I'm never sure, and I never remember. He took a moment to think, while also focusing on the road. I noticed he had slowed down significantly, the car merely coasting through town. Your mom was an amazing woman, though I don't think that comes as a surprise. You look a lot like her, Kim. You have her eyes, her nose, and definitely her hair, except hers was long, reaching all the way down to her back. I woke up every morning tangled in this stuff, he snickered penitently. I smiled faintly, one more piece to complete my personal puzzle. I fidgeted in my seat, placing one foot on top of the other. What was she like? He adjusted himself, too, and rubbed the steering wheel, clearly uncomfortable. Lively, for one. She had enough energy for the both of us. When we first met, she was really nice to me, treating me to lunch a couple of times. You guys met while you were at work, right? I asked. That's right. She was in college, and I was there on a job. At the time, it seemed silly to meet that way, but now it almost seems like fate. The look on his face was detached, and I started watching the road for him to make sure he didn't go over the lines. She had aspirations. Our friendship was strong. We had a true connection right away. I got to learn so much about who she was and why I was drawn to her. She was an ambitious, endlessly kind woman with enough patience to last, but a temper that could ruin lives. She was perfect, in every conceivable way. She dealt with me and nurtured me when I was struggling inside. I stopped drinking for her. Oh, I would have stopped breathing if she asked me to. I was dumbfounded. I had never heard my dad talk like this. For him, this was poetry. The expression he never allowed to be free around anyone, not even himself. I could see just how much he loved my mom, and how much he misses her. And now, I felt his harsh words last night even more. How he would trade me for five more minutes with her, even if he says he didn't mean it. He added, She loved kids. Uh, it was her dream to work with them, teach them, help them grow, and become amazing people in the future. All she wanted was to change how you viewed the world, give you a different perspective than what may seem obvious. Her presence was magic. I heard his blinker tick as he turned down our abandoned strip. We were almost home now. A warm feeling of collective remembrance and empathy swelled in the deepest pit of my stomach. A nearly snuffed ember glowed once again as the spark was fanned by common compassion for my mother. I adjusted myself on the seat. My eyes fell to my lap. Heavy. I didn't want to push him anymore. Thank you for telling me that. I showed an uncomfortable appreciation. The car then jerked left as we pulled into the driveway, hitting a couple of small bumps until we stopped and the car shut off. Everything went quiet when the car shut down. That constant vibration in the air and in my body became a fixture of normality. Once gone, everything seemed strange, temporarily tricking me into thinking that sensation would always exist. And when it disappeared, I was left in a nihilistic state, a state that left me sinking into my seat and experiencing a level of relaxation that far surpassed my own bed. Caught up in the sensation that was peace, I was not able to restrain my words. It was as if my brain didn't command them, rather, my inner child did. Dad... Could you please not drink today? I asked softly, barely able to speak the words past my cotton mouth. Not even one. His hand grabbed the car door handle, ready to exit the vehicle, but he stopped and looked at me once again through the mirror. 
He sighed. I don't drink because I want to. I do it because I'm weak. People like me, we need things like alcohol to survive, to cope with life. Some people need a cup of coffee to function. Some need a hobby, but me... I cut him off. You need mom. He turned away from the mirror, looking at me directly. But my eyes were occupied on the trees now. I could feel his stare, almost hostile, but mostly concerned. I knew what he was looking at. The bandage. Personally, I almost forgot it was there. The sticky feeling had already cemented my mind as normal. But for him, it was a reminder of his sins. And now he too realized why the lady at the grocery store had an uncomfortable look on her face when he got angry. You're right. I do need her. But I don't have that. You have me. He grabbed the handle again and opened it. As soon as the door flew open, I was released from my trance. In no rush to move again, I too unbuckled my seatbelt. After a moment, I slid out of the car and took the bags with me, and he was right there to meet me outside the car. He extended his arm for something to carry, so I handed him the snack bag. He took it and let his arm fall to the side. But before he turned around, he said, I won't drink today. I can't promise you tomorrow or the next day. He seemed on edge again. It didn't feel like it was directed at me specifically. Sometimes it seems like I'm not consciously doing it. I will try, sweetie. I simply nodded in affirmation. We approached the front door, ready to embrace the rest of the day. He took his time unlocking the front door, especially making sure that it didn't fly against the wall when it got open. We maneuvered inside and took in the acquainted, dank stench. He didn't seem phased whatsoever, which always bothered me. He set his bag by the edge of the counter closest to the front door, ensuring he wouldn't forget it tomorrow. I opened the fridge to store the jug of milk, hoping it hadn't gotten too warm. Standing inside the open door, I saw him walk over to the couch. He always sat on the far right, toward the center of the room. He already had the TV turned on, set to a crime drama that I personally didn't care for. It focused more on the drama between characters than actual police work. I debated on what I should do. I debated on what I should do. He slumped, and I kind of slipped into a lingering status myself. I couldn't deny his civility and wanted to indulge in that as much as I could. This is the first day we've really spent together in a long time. So why cut it short by retreating to my room? Even if it feels forced or owed, I had to cherish this. I moved to the couch as well, not expecting much else to come of it, but trying to enjoy the quality time nonetheless. It was mid-afternoon now, and we sat in near-perfect silence, just watching TV. After about an hour, he got up and returned with a sparkling water to drink. He looked at me, I gave him a smirk, and he knew I was proud of him, even though I knew it wouldn't last. We cycled through the channels for a while, holding small benign conversations about shows he recently watched or an old movie he caught one day. General banter, nothing lively or even that interesting, but we were having a conversation. At last. As the hours passed and the sun had begun to set, I started to feel drowsy. The weight of yesterday's emotions and today's reprieve started to collapse my muscle. We ended up on a talk show that couldn't keep my interest for more than a minute, and I was hardly able to keep my eyes open. I tried talking to keep myself awake, but it came out as jumbled nonsense. I numbly nodded through a few minutes, and those minutes bled to an hour, or longer, I'm not sure. I slipped into unconsciousness, just picturing colors, hearing the noise of the TV, and creating nonsensical images in my brain. A while later, I was startled by a sudden movement on the other end of the couch, placed directly into the moment he clambered on top of me yesterday to hold me down. But that wasn't reality. Still, I awoke with force and glared at him. He was only standing up. Did I scare you? He asked with a light chuckle. 
Yeah, uh, a bit. I exhaled. Sorry, uh, I'm going to bed now. Remember, I have to get up early. I rubbed one eye. What time is it? He angled his head and peered at the stove's digital clock. About nine. I yawned. Nine? Wow, where did the day go? I giggled. You're telling me. He smirked. I immediately pictured that elderly shadow in my room, and for the first time in a long while, felt sanctuary in my dad's darkened face. I... I think I'll stay on the couch tonight. <clears throat> Sounds good, sweetheart. Uh, thank you for being with me today. Get some sleep. I laid myself up flat, pushing my feet to the other end of the couch where he had previously sat. I tried to get comfortable, using the arm of the couch as a pillow. Good night, Dad. I shut my eyes and listened to him walk away, closing the door softly behind him. The TV chattered in the background. Incoherent words pricked my ears as I slowly drifted off into a deeper sleep. <laughs>